for the most part, we're in the text understanding world. Large language models are proven to quote unquote, let's say quote unquote, understand text. Uh, what's what's your vision for when these other modalities of data start coming, both on the image side, the especially the video side, as well as companies start to amass large amounts of video content? Yeah, you're you're exactly right. I mean, this is why everybody that's that's uh, you know hearing this uh, this show should have goosebumps because for thousands of years, people have been imagining what what um, the international community would be like if we had a Tower of Babel, mm. and yet with we're within striking distance of a true Tower of Babel that's going to be agnostic to the human language that things are authored, recorded, or captured in. That's not going to care what system of record, but as you just expressed, that is multimodal aware, right? That's not going to care about the audio, video images, or or um, or, or videos, or, or other types of object types that it's going to intersect with as well. Um, this, this will create an ability to do total information awareness. Now, as we tap into more of those resources, uh, Mark, that's why we connect to your previous uh, thoughts, right? The scale uh, you know, and efficiency is going to be important because as they're going to want to see more and do more, um, you know, you, you better be doing it in a way that's economical. And like I said, each of us uh, holds a piece to the puzzle as well. And, um, and as long as each one of you finds your passions and, and we can find each other and, and work together towards positive ends, the future is bright. It doesn't have to be this darkness that a lot of these AI carnival barkers uh, you know, talk about as well, um, because it's within the realm of possibility for us to nurture and guide it towards that. Welcome to episode five of the iPortfolio podcast, the place to get to know experts and companies building great products with machine learning. Today's guest is Igor Yablokov. Uh, he's currently the CEO of Prion, a full stack AI knowledge management platform that just received $100 million in funding. Previously, he sold his speech recognition company Yak to Amazon, which became the foundation for Amazon Alexa and led innovation, innovative teams that worked on the precursor to IBM Watson AI at IBM. In my former life, I was a competitor to Igor's current company, so this discussion is especially interesting to me. Igor, welcome to the show. Mark, thanks for having me. Let's begin with uh, what problem are you solving at Prion and why is it hard? Yeah, that's a great question. And obviously, you know the answer for why it's it's hard as well as, as you just uh, depicted, right? Um, so when you think about uh, consumer tech companies typically de-risk things as interaction methods, that's why, you know, in our homes now, we have uh, things like HomePods and, and uh, from Apple, we have uh, Google Home devices with Google Assistants. We have uh, things like Amazon Echoes with Alexa. Um, and we plug them in, you know, after procuring them from an Apple store, or from a Best Buy retail store, and they immediately light up and say hello, right? And you can uh, interact with them in a couple dozen different domains. News, weather, sports, music, and things of that sort that essentially are backed by language models, but more appropriately, hierarchical language models and, and things of that sort. So it's deterministic in terms of both languages and content that everybody expects to interact with. And an interesting surprise uh, was that a lot of um, interest in these early platforms was centered around um, music, uh, around weather results, of course, kitchen timers and the like as well. So it was kind of easy to kind of uh, reinforce, you know, what the scientists uh, should be working on to improve acoustic models, language models and the like. Now, on the other side, right, if you think about our waking hours, you know, in, in the working world, you have to show up with an AI that's completely empty, an empty vessel for them to contribute things that you have no idea what they're going to put into. And yet they need high levels of accuracy, scale, security, and speed because of the seriousness of, of your respective uh, missions that is reliable, available, serviceable. So it's a paradox. They need something that's even more robust than the things that we use at home. And yet it's a blind trust where we'll have no idea what they're going to put into um, uh, uh, those platforms. And Mark, that that becomes the genesis of, of the complexity of it. Interesting, interesting. One of the, the beautiful things about these consumer-facing products is that they can collect you know, tons of data. I have tons of different people speaking, accents, ages, location, so much more. 
telemetry with which I can train more accurate models. And as you mentioned, bounded domains so I can tune, especially a lot of the speech to text models in order to do natural language understanding, I can tune them. But now you're saying in the enterprise domain, I don't have people from all over the world speaking or interacting with my um, sort of knowledge management or even search system, just interfacing with information. How do companies sort of start to navigate that now moving into the future where the way that we interact with a company's information will now be almost verbal at different levels of the organization? You're exactly right, Mark. Not, o- not only do they not allow you to use their own, uh, you know, logs, you know, for training, they certainly, you know, wouldn't allow it to go to uh, their peers and or potentially competitor organizations in order to, you know, train uh, the, these models for their own benefit uh, as well. So uh, it becomes, uh, you know, a heady problem from that standpoint. Now, the good news is that technology has caught up you know, to a level of sophistication so that you can do a lot of automatic adaptation, you know, to, to the content that they would be ingesting and the interactions that they would have in order to safeguard it onto their platforms. Uh, Prion, um, uh, you know, started as a, you know, a public cloud multi-tenant environment, but is drifting towards private cloud and on-prem. And that's because we don't need any API calls out to any cognitive service that AWS Azure or GCP has. And in that way, we can drift closer to uh, the core IP, what makes you know, um, a pharma company unique, a semiconductor uh, company unique, you know, a defense uh, contractor uh, unique as well. Um, and, and it becomes properly walled off from the rest of the world. I saw an interesting post recently from an engineer at one of these top large language model companies and what he was saying when people go to tune these language models you know your hyperparameter tuning trying to make this thing more accurate he was actually saying that none of that actually matters it's all about your data quality so this is a very interesting time that we're moving into where i'm not going to let any of my data leave my organization because that now becomes the true uh, differentiator yeah, you're exactly right. That's why, you know, we spent years perfecting an ingest uh, pipeline and process. Uh, we do not take, you know, connectors and integrations from third parties. We home build this these things because there's certain signals that they push right into the engine core, right into the model as well. As we decompose, you know, uh, a source, you know, like Confluence, like SharePoint, like ServiceNow, SAP, you know, uh, Salesforce, S3 buckets and the like that could contain PDFs, PowerPoints, Word files, web pages, and things of that sort, and take them through an automatic, uh, you know, process to develop the fabric uh, that an organization is going to be interacting with as well. So that's a lot of our core IP is creating an end to end system that can go from content to experiences all in one place. Versus them trying to, you know, take the piecemeal approach of trying to develop an anti prion you know, taking a little mm-hmm. bit of one person's dialogue management, a little bit somebody else's vector databases, somebody else's model management, somebody else's, you know, you know, speech recognition, OCR, NER, so on and so forth. You know, we essentially home uh, build the whole thing in the same way that Apple, you know, builds their own chip, device, operating system and application. And that's why they have screaming uh, performance with low energy use in the same way that NVIDIA, you know, you know, started with uh, GPU and said, hey, we need to work on our own CPU, right? Grace and Hopper, right? We need our own networking backbone. Let's get Mellanox in there as well. They're also vertically integrating their stack so that they can, uh, you know, essentially control the experience for highest power and lowest energy use as well, highest speed uh, as well, similar uh, to our inclinations with our software. Yeah, we're seeing a lot more just in general, I think, this focus on sustainable compute even more so from machine learning applications. And uh, there's like almost a mandate, hey, if you're bringing in this new AI technology into the business, show me why it's green, show me how it's green. What's your thoughts on how accelerated compute drives more sustainable compute over time? Right. So in the same way that all of you, um, you know, understand the persona uh, that, that I would tongue in cheek call the Unix graybeard, 
that still knows how to write assembly code, which is the highest and tightest of code uh, possible that screams. And I'm sure as you get closer to firmware and microcode, there's still very exotic people at NVIDIA that know how to do that uh, as well. Um, the, similarly, because we're the OGs of AI in, in, in many ways, we still, you know, we worked on developing these style of engines before GPUs existed. And so once you gave us the firepower of a GPU, we were still creating an energy efficient incarnation of this, especially as we have to get to on-prem uh, style uh, deployments. Uh, and so the paradox for us is how do we deliver accuracy um, at, at, um, a, at a higher order than some of the consumer incarnations or modern expressions of, of the Bing bards and GPTs that you see out there? Uh, while uh, being 100 times more energy uh, efficient as well. Now, in some ways, you know, we followed a different evolutionary path than those uh, platforms that I just mentioned. You know, so there's two ways for an animal, you know, to grow up. One is in the rainforest and one is in the desert. You know, in the rainforest, you have plenty of food, plenty of food, and it's, and it's a more inviting ecosystem. You have your water you know, you have your food, you have, you know, some shelter and, and things of that sort. In a desert, you have almost no water, you have almost no food. And so you have to adapt in a different way. Curiously, that forced adaptation of the Prion platform towards scarcity, right? Now, you know, over half a decade later benefits us as people start saying, hey, these technologies are important and we should have it drift towards our core IP. But that means more pub, uh, private cloud and on-prem style uh, deployments. And now that weakness of ours turned into a strength. Mm -hmm. And so you're exactly right. That's that's where, and, and that's one of the underpinnings of what we would consider uh, responsible computing. But, you know, I'll, I'll give you guys a surprise uh, use case here shortly that shows you um, that there's another way to think about uh, energy efficiency as well. Okay, go ahead and expand on that. that um, well, I'm, I'm quite curious there. Right. I mean, you know, our, uh, the industry at large, especially the AI accelerator uh, industry at large, has always taken a bad rap on, on how you are in, increasing carbon emissions, right? Uh, especially when, when these things were uh, being used for cryptocurrencies and the like as well. But now I'm going to give you a counter argument and a, and a su positive surprise of GPU style uh, technologies. And certainly in this case, I'm talking about the NVIDIA platform. So for years, there was an energy company that has been trying to create an AI for their outage and maintenance services group. They poured millions of dollars to uh, construct such an, uh, such an AI. And why did they want this thing? Because they predicted they could reduce the downtime of nuclear power plants by half if they had such a thing, which meant, guess what? They didn't have to spin up fossil fuel burning plants during that shortfall in baseload, especially in deep summer and deep uh, winter months. So that was one issue they were trying to tackle. A bigger issue they were trying to tackle, um, you know, if it, and and this is just um, you know an intuitive thing. Once once I say it, is that if any of you have seen um, uh, any sort of documentaries on Three Mile Island, you'll actually find that that we were within thirty minutes of of the eastern seaboard being irradiated. And when Congress did an investigation, they actually found six reasons why why that calamity almost uh, happened the first was a design flaw the second was a faulty valve but four out of, four out of six conditions were knowledge management issues essentially engineers and technicians were not getting access uh to the correct uh information that they needed in order to safeguard um uh the the plant and so putting two and two together now instead of you know uh, ai accelerators being a villain you know, in in uh, in our ecosystems, you can actually see it. Uh, you know, being uh, um, unlocking a reduction in uh, in carbon and unlocking an, uh, an increase in the safety of these critical uh, systems that support our way of life. Hmm. I I was talking to to someone is it a couple of weeks ago, and they were saying that an op unoptimized SQL query is wasting money. And that that really stuck with me because there are so many SQL queries that get generated across enterprises all over the world 
And all of that compute is actually probably taking a lot longer than it should in reality, which means that we're just sort of burning up all of this energy uh, doing inefficient compute. So it's very interesting that you you point out um, some of these nuances with getting information in a timely manner to, in this case, prevent a nuclear power plant from, from going down. So now in line with that, there's this notion of a responsive organization. Um, what What's your view on, if we look at a company as an organism, its speed to actually respond is almost a good trait for survival. How do you see um, this new form of knowledge management changing those companies into more responsive companies? Right. Yeah. And, and the good news is um, uh, being a responsive company uh, doesn't have to be um, at, um, at the mercy of, of not being a responsible uh, company simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Right. And so let's, let's understand what is being a responsive company means. Uh, it means uh, ensuring that you have high accuracy results uh, to, you know, the practitioners of every function in your organization, right? So that's one thing. Um, so that means no hallucinations, you know, get them the facts um, so that they not only have decision uh, advantage, they have decision dominance, right? They're, they're, everybody needs to know something in order to do something. So that's the first thing. The second is, is uh, you know, security. Right. You got to make sure that the right people in the right context are seeing what they're supposed to be seeing. Right. So, you know, being responsive also means that you're you're automatically figuring out through some form of zero trust architecture what you need to do instead of uh, people having to, you know, hop on one leg and and figure out, you know, how do I you know, what are all the conditions necessary to access this information that can also slow them down. You know, the third is scale, right? To be responsive, you need to be able to put everything in one place versus the fragmentation of logging into all of these disparate systems like, okay, in order to understand, um, you know, this this uh, particular workflow or, or solve this particular problem, I got to log into service now, now I got to log into Salesforce, now I got to log into SAP, now I got to log into DocuSign, now I got to log into SharePoint, now I got to look at this S3 bucket, now I got to <coughs> do this SQL query, now I got to go at, look at this Sparkle graph. What is this nonsense? You know, that kind of just gums up the works in terms of, you know, the discovery of critical intelligence. And the last thing is speed. What is speed? Well, uh, you know, some is time to value. Some is how fast is the inference, right? So that I can take more shots on goal as I try to discover a solution around a particular problem. Some is how fast can I ingest content as I discover the AI being out of domain, that I have new uh, new information that I received from my customers, from my partners, from my employees, you know, from, uh, you know, published sources that I trust or I have licensed content that I want to bring to bear. The world has changed uh, in some ways. Uh, you know, if there's a critical piece of information that I need to get out to my workforce or to my clients, can I update this this model sub-second so that all of the channels that are subscribing to the knowledge fabric that I'm tending to are getting that critical piece of information that they need, you know, perhaps due to some emergency condition, maybe to, because of some sale or things of that sort, you can find both positive and negative reasons for why, you know, you need to respond quickly uh, to something. And so those, those are the birthright of Prion. You know, we knew that eventually these, these folks um, uh, are going to w- want to reduce uh, knowledge friction. And that meant inserting a new um, layer into the enterprise software stack that unified all of this disparate knowledge. For the first time ever, it's, it's uh, not only within our lifetimes, but inside of this decade, we can foresee that there's going to be this new knowledge OS that's going to be inserted in these organizations that's going to be agnostic of uh, the language that things are authored, um, uh, captured, or recorded in, that is not going to care where the system of records are that it needs to pull this information from, and it's not going to care about the underlying object type, whether it's audio, video, images, or text. You're going to be able to drop a prompt on the top, and it's going to answer uh, you know, your questions, it's going to perform workflows, and then eventually it's going to do a range of auto- automations uh, mm-hmm. over time. And this is going to give them, um, you know, what they need in sub-second that may have taken uh, them hours 
uh, to discover these solutions in the past as well. This personally to me is is fantastical because it essentially uh, increases the productivity uh, for all of us potentially by an order of magnitude before the end of this decade. Order of magnitude product productivity increase. What do you think the impact of that is in, I guess, which industry do you see it really having a, its biggest impact versus, I think manufacturing is quite an interesting one because what what's happening to some degree now, a lot of experts who've been in these legacy companies they have all the knowledge and now they're sort of phasing themselves out. There are folks who've been training with them for a while, but there's this notion of capturing the intelligence of your workforce to continuously uh, train others to essentially up level a level one to a level three and a half instead of a, uh, excuse me, in a couple of months instead of a couple of years. Uh, what's your thoughts on capturing legacy information, especially from humans who are leaving the workforce? You're exactly right, Mark. That's that's uh, of critical importance. That's why we don't talk about our platform as an artificial intelligence. We call it an augmented intelligence because um, humans, as I mentioned before, we're a critical part of these knowledge workflows. We consume, curate, and contribute knowledge. And the individuals that you just um, uh, expressed um, are, uh, are gold mine of tribal knowledge in these organizations as veteran uh, contributors to supporting these platforms that in turn, you know, drive our communities, uh, as well. And so that's why we, we spent a lot of time and energy, uh, in terms of constructing a welcoming environment, you know, uh, that, that, uh, that's why I hired UX folks from Apple. This is why I worked with behavioral scientists so that they can contribute their tribal knowledge into uh, the system. So not just as a consumption interface, but as a system that would be very easy for them to use. And Mark, you know, um, the second piece to that is not just the user experience, is the fact that our ingest process even does automatic OCR and handwriting recognition in order to tap into scanned in documents potentially from dozens of years ago, if not a hundred years ago, in order to untap the tribal knowledge that may exist, you know, from the past uh, as well, in order to eliminate problems. Here's a big surprise. That same uh, energy company, uh, you know, that I mentioned to you um, was going to, you know, spending uh, time to, to create a new project that would have cost them millions of dollars. And yet they were able to find that in the 60s that they already performed that experiment and then it failed. And so they didn't have to waste, you know, you know, time and energy and resources and opportunity cost, you know, you know, for their engineers, they can go ahead and tackle a new problem. And that's for the reasons that you just expressed. It was a lot easier for for a, a platform like this to illuminate um, uh, tribal knowledge of the past. When you told me that you built your own, all of your own connectors, that was the one thing that truly blew my mind about your platform, just because many different search companies out, out there will rely on, you know, I might rely on another vendor for, mm -hmm. hey, they're just going to build our connectors for me. There are tons of open source connectors. Everyone who's building some type of large language model application now probably leverages open source. And one of the things that I observed when I I worked on that problem specifically was just the uh, the inconsistency of the results that you get from passing, let's say, a PDF, and that's probably mm -hmm. one of the most prevalent documents. So why why did you choose to rewrite that when there's so many other things out there? Yeah, it, there there's uh, multi pronged reasons uh, for it. Uh, Kirsten Wahlberg is our independent board member, and uh, she's um, she used to be the CTO at DocuSign and the CIO mm -hmm. of Salesforce. And it was a hard one, you know. When when she first crossed paths with us, she said, "Look, we've we've had to tap into every system or record that you can think of, right?" To uh, at DocuSign and some of her past experiences as well. And she's like, "Even for those vendors, you know, we've had all sorts of garbage in, garbage out situations." She's like, we learned the hard way that we had to write these things for ourselves in order to keep, um, you know, the, the supply chain of knowledge, you know, and content flowing into our system app appropriately. Um, and, and so considering that she wasn't even working on a platform that was, you know, AI native, 
it's even of more critical importance for us to cleanse uh, and and safeguard and have signals flowing from these system of records to us because we're content based, mm-hmm. right? You know, we're we're not just worried about the vessel, the envelope. Uh, of content flowing into our, our system as well. And so those are things that are purpose built for us. Uh, and, and it takes longer, of course, and requires a lot more technical sophistication to construct these, these things, but we learn the hard way. And, and we have a very novel way of, of essentially tapping into these things, but it provides signaling into, uh, into the models, into the engines, into other uh, componentry that we have that allow us to essentially um, lead in, in terms of accuracy. It allows us to do it speedily. It allows us to uh, to create a more secure system. Uh, and it allows us to reach a level of scale uh, that are is not one order of magnitude greater um, than, than other expressions of these style of technologies, but multiple orders of magnitude um, uh, greater. So that's why we do it, right? It's... it's um, you know, you know, if you want to make a good pizza or bagel, you better have uh, nice uh, water going into it. Yeah, the the whole New York pizza water when people fly right. water down from New York. I, when I learned that, I was like, oh, that that's aggressive. But I, I guess I understand. What's what's your thoughts on scale? So as as this problem scales out, I go to a small bank and I. Or I go to a small manufacturing firm, I ingest their documents. Okay, I can answer a certain amount of questions. Mm-hmm. Now I go to like the Chevrons of the world. These large oil companies have been collecting data for decades. How does the problem now change at scale? Yeah, you're exactly right. And that, and that's uh, and that's why scale all also intersects with energy efficiency. Right. And that's why, you know, they're like, oh, you know, are you just doing, um, you know, energy efficiency in order to promote an ESG score? I'm like, you know, mm-hmm. with energy efficiency comes, you know, a greater responsibility and, and greater opportunity for supporting more of their mission set. And so, you know, in some cases, um, you know, not only have been we've been measured more than 2x more accurate than some of the other big tech expressions of this style of technology and 10 times faster on ingest and inference, but also in some cases, they're limited to about 100,000 uh, pages in their index. And our rex, the next release is going to support a billion objects per collection on our platform as well. And part of it is, I, as, as I express tongue in cheek, uh, in terms of those Unix uh, graybeards, uh, we're the equivalent of those in the AI industry. We knew how to make these um, uh, these engines and models before GPUs existed. As a result, we were very responsible in terms of of uh, you know leveraging you know those those style of acceleration technologies, and that that is allowing us to achieve a level of scale while still maintaining accuracy. By the way. Yes. Right. Because because if I show up in an organization and say, hey, I can get you 100 percent accuracy, but I can only do uh, a search against a single page. That's not interesting because you can eyeball it and get to the same level of accuracy without needing uh, any sort of um, uh, knowledge management platform. If I showed up and said, hey, I can do a million pages but I can only give you 50% accuracy. That's also an interesting, it's like, you know, I might as well be, you know, Zoltar, you know, uh, you know, or a magic eight ball. Uh, so it's finding that expression. That's the equilibrium between accuracy and scale is, uh, is very important. And we've been able to find it, you know, in, in internal to the prime platform. One thing that's very exciting. I think that we'll see a lot more next year is a greater degree of content understanding. The, for the most part, we're in the text understanding world. Large language models are proven to quote unquote, let's say quote unquote, understand text. Uh, what's what's your vision for when these other modalities of data start coming, both on the image side, the especially the video side, as well as companies start to amass large amounts of video content. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. I mean, this is why everybody that's that's uh, you know hearing this uh, this show should have goosebumps because for thousands of years, people have been imagining what, what, um, the international community would be like if we had a tower of Babel. Mm. And yet with, we're within striking distance of a true tower of Babel. That's going to be agnostic to the human language that things are authored, recorded, or captured in. That's not going to care what system of record, but as you just expressed, 
that is multimodal aware, right? That's not going to care about the audio, video images, or or um, or, or videos, or, or other types of object types that it's going to intersect with as well. Um, this this will create an ability to do total information awareness. Now, as we tap into more of those resources, uh, Mark, that's why we connect to your previous uh, thoughts, right? The scale. Uh, you know, and efficiency is going to be important because as they're going to want to see more and do more, um, you know, you, you better be doing it in a way that's economical, right? And especially, you know, when you have supply chain issues, trying to fill as many orders as possible for these AI accelerators, people are going to have to do, you know, that same job with whatever cards they're dealt with, you know, as they're, you know, working with public cloud, you know, private cloud or on-prem resources uh, of, of platforms similar to NVIDIA's. You, you ended up redoing, I think, a lot of your NLP modules from scratch inside of Prion, which I, I found mm-hmm. to be quite interesting just because I'm like, oh, wow, now you really have pure control over inputs, outputs, mm-hmm. scaling, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're in the age of large language models. This year has mm-hmm. done a, a ton of things to open people's minds to the possibilities. What excites you about the current, I wouldn't say pace, but the current evolution of large language models in the industry? Um, not much. Not much. <laughs> I mean, San, Thanos can snap his fingers and make them all disappear, and we would still be able to operate as a, as a going concern, right? I mean, look, um, I'll give you a perfect example, right? The past predicts the future, right? When we were constructing uh, what was codenamed the Prime Engine, by the way, that's a piece of trivia for everybody. So Alexa is my older sister's name, which is a coincidence. Uh, but the code name for what eventually became uh, Alexa was Prion, and we just ended up reusing it here. And so many folks um, uh, in the past thought I was a complete knucklehead for trying to construct our own uh, recognizer and our own end-to-end system. By the way, a surprise uh, piece of trivia is that we codenamed the uh, the internals of our uh, engine architecture as cascading lattice transduction, named after the airport code where we were headquartered, CLT. Complete uh-huh. nonsense uh, term, but it was an early incarnation of a neural network style platform before uh, Hinton's paper uh, came out. And it was end to end. So it wasn't just speech recognition, but speech output and um, uh, machine translation. We even had early designs on a unified acoustic model to support all languages so that you can support uh, compound languages. Like Mark, you and I may be of, you know, from uh, multicultural backgrounds and things of that sort, or at least have friends, family members, and colleagues that are f- from that as well. And it allowed a lot more freedom, you know, for people to, you know, bring their true selves and, um, you know, uh, uh, even as they intersected with these style of technologies. So here's the critique that I was getting last time. Igor, why are you making this this platform code named Prion in the past with your own recognizer and the like when you can just go to Carnegie Mellon's website and download the Sphinx engine from the famed Kai Fu Lee? It's open mm-hmm. source. Just start using that. Now, here's the surprise. We were the first ever AI cloud company. We had dozens of enterprise and carrier customers, including Sprint and Microsoft, we had almost 50 million users on our platform, and none of you that are hearing my voice ever knew we existed before uh, the Amazon acquisition. Google tried to acquire us. Microsoft t- tried to acquire us as well. It was purpose-built. Telco grade, bank grade, defense grade, all of these things. And so while open source has these interesting expressions of these style of technologies and they publish papers on them and things of that sort that becomes the primordial oozing ground um, and test kitchen, if you will. Mm-hmm. That's not the same as, as building something that, that you can run, um, you know, a critical infrastructure on. And so while you can be inspired by some of the work that the open source community is doing, that to actually put it into production in hospitals in power plants and things of that sort, you know, requires uh, a different level of capability. And the metaphor or analogy that I would use is this, um, you know, for flight, a proof of concept is a paper airplane and you're tossing it from one side of the room to the other. That's a bit different than making an Airbus or a Boeing. Yes. Right. In terms of the cargo is different. 
the 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 distance it has to travel the safety um uh, is different and in the control um um a sequence the flight deck is far more complex in order to manage uh the airframe the individuals or cargo it needs to safeguard and the rest of the community that it has to safeguard the speed that it has to uh, travel as well and the fact that it has to do it day in and day out and so mm-hmm. look a lot of times everybody thinks software is software it's not software is not software it's it, it you think it's the same because you think it's code you know us as humans we're we're, we're um we're tactile creatures we can tell the difference holding one piece of fabric from another and we can feel it we can tell the the weight of a book that has a hundred pages versus a book that has a thousand pages with software we think it's the same here's an ai model and here's another ai model it's not the same it's not the same what were some of the the hardest challenges you had in building out this pipeline and product over time because you've been working on this problem i, I think what what's very interesting about when I, I heard your story was that you'd been kind of building up towards this stuff on the enterprise uh, level for a very long time. Can you tell us some of the hard parts? Yeah. So, um, um, Mark, even more surprisingly, we've been building, I've personally built, built, uh, been building this over 20 years. My chief scientist, David Nahamu, when he, he ran the human language technologies team at IBM Research, he's been working on this for f- over 40 years, hmm. right? So, uh, you know, think about a typical pilot spends uh, a short amount of time learning how to fly and the rest of their time they're dealing with exceptions and figuring out how to manage their airframe, you know, their crew, you know, their passengers, their cargo, the rest of the environment uh, that they're operating in as well. So we've spent a lot uh, longer time thinking about these style of technologies and how they intersected with academia and how they intersected with commercial entities, government entities and and the like. So I can't, it's hard for me to point to one thing uh, that's Mm -hmm. been a challenge because they've been countless challenges uh, that needed to, um, uh, to be solved. Uh, as you uh, develop such things, what does the user experience have to look like? So it's as easy as possible and, and hides a lot of the complexity uh, behind the scenes, both in terms of use, um, uh, inference, of course, as, as all of you would call it, and then also on the ingest pipeline. Um, but my grandfather was a watchmaker, right? And so, you know, I, I looked at uh, when he was, uh, you know, toiling over these things, and you had all of this complexity with the gears and things of that sort. But then when you turn it over, it just simply told the time, right? That's what we expect when we plug in a gaming console. That's what we expect when we, uh, you know, interface with any of our smartphones is the fact that, you know, it's easy to use, but it, you know, hides a lot of complexity behind the scenes and a whole ecosystem to make sure that it works from power plants to networks, to the the AI accelerators, the GPU accelerators, to the software and things of that sort. So you just press the button and it just lights up and and puts a little logo on there and you're off on your on your merry way. Um, so that's that's a, a high degree of complexity to be able to do that. Now to do that requires a lot of patience and time. And the goodness with this particular venture is is we were able to cross pass, um, uh, you know, with with. Um, you know, some benefactors, you know, some investors that understood that there was a big opportunity to to develop and, and uh, birth this style of platform for more, um, you know, serious pursuits um, and and essentially had the level of patience to support us for for many years um, while while we work towards something that that could support more austere and more uh, critical environments. And that's and that's what we have. And, you know, we can talk about some of our clients here shortly that will essentially reference to that and support, you know, my argument that this is designed for more serious pursuits. Yeah, go ahead and talk about who is your who is your ideal client? Because uh, I've always found the the separation of domains when it comes to search and knowledge management and um, information synthesis to be quite interesting. There's a whole e-commerce domain where it's, uh, I think the, the vocabulary of the user changes quite fast. Then there's traditional enterprise where there's typically not a lot of training data for different types of common approaches to 
become more accurate. What's your thoughts on, you know, which industries have been seeing a lot of success? Yeah, so I'll start by bookending uh, your your question on who our ideal client is, sure. uh, and then and then we'll get to the the sweet spot right of of uh, actual use. Um, our ideal client is a human being because we yeah. all need to know something to do something, right? So that that's both the opportunity and challenge of these style of problems is the fact that we can go in 360 degrees and support a wide range of industries and a wide range of use cases as well, which, uh, which is often a challenge with these style of horizontal platforms, especially when they're end-to-end. Uh, uh, -end. Now, more specifically, and, and recently we launched an applications um, you know, team and, and product so that we can go after, uh, concrete use cases that have very real, you know, time to value and business case association. So think of a revenue accelerator for a CRO that has sales enablement materials, sales engineering materials and support materials and help desk materials and things of that sort. They know exactly what they can put into, into that and can show true connectivity to top line. Um, and, and so that, you know, is, uh, selling like hotcakes, uh, recently and, and we, uh, are expressing that offering on our website now as well. So those are the book, uh, that the two, um, you know, far book ends from abstract to literal representation. Now in between, this is a cross industry platform as well. And so we have clients, uh, in uh, the semiconductor industry and we're proud to call uh, NVIDIA as one of our clients. When you get GeForce or Mellanox support, it's actually Prion's uh, platform behind the scenes that are that is working in tandem with your technologies like Revabot in order to mm -hmm. express answers to hundreds of thousands of users, I think, uh, per month, if not per day, uh, that are showing up into uh, the platform. Uh, we have um, uh, clients like Dell that are reselling this into civic environments. So, for instance, the city of Amarillo uh, Texas is using this to power a digital human so that they can deliver all sorts of knowledge relating uh, to um, uh, the, the, the different uh, uh, capabilities that they have uh, for, their, uh, for their citizens. And they can deliver it uh, to a multicultural population by supporting uh, multiple languages. And then you also have highbrow things like the World Economic Forum. That are delivering strategic intelligence to all world leaders uh, of a critical nature, um, both from their content, academic partners, and uh, world governments that they partner with as well. And so those those are different examples beyond uh, the energy uh, company that that I already mentioned. So it's it's an exciting time to be alive in this field. Um, and and the reason why I, I even call it our birthright, you know, to support. Um, you know, some of these uh, uh, institutions is because we've been toiling, you know, you know, towards this for decades, you know, just being true believers, there was no capital in it. The network in environment didn't, um, uh, didn't support this yet. There were no accelerators, AI accelerators, the software wasn't quite there. And but we've been slowly you know, working towards it until now, all of the fundamental building blocks came together. And now, you know, uh, you know, Mark, as, as you're, you know, in, uh, in the, the field as well, you're seeing this, uh, this Cambrian explosion of, uh, of opportunity um, and risk, unfortunately, that, uh, that we're seeing today. Yeah, I know a fair number of folks, search was always a, a niche field and now it seems like every single person who's doing nlp is like okay search is the number one use case leveraging language models leveraging uh, retrieval augmented generation so it's interesting that you've been playing this game for a long time and to to see where the the new approaches will will pan out versus these uh, more mature adopting some of the best parts of the newest thing will will lead forward yeah, a, a, a funny expression popped in my head uh, uh, yesterday, which is uh, uh, imagine the LL Cool J rap, right? Don't call it a chatbot. We've been here for years, mm. right? I mean, it's you think that you're seeing something new, but it's it's been a long time in coming, and and lots of pieces had to come together, right? I mean, look at all the fits and starts, you know, that Nvidia had to uh, work on uh, in their ilk, you know, to uh, you know 
uh, to create uh, the opportunity for acceleration to make some of these bigger things even possible. Lots of discovery on the software side, um, mm -hmm. lots of work on the cloud side, lots of work on the networking side. You know, to to support these things, the CPUs that, that you know that had to um, essentially uh, act as bootloaders to the GPUs as well. So a lot of these things had to come together. But look, it's not about search. You know, you know, people who are fixating on search and I'm like, it's not about search. It's the fact that, you know, knowledge managed is a bigger is a bigger construct because um, what search represents is only phase one. Mm -hmm. You know, and the reason why it's only phase one is think about a typical intern that comes into your respective environments the, in their early days. You ask them just to find things. Here's where the cafeteria is. Here's where the restroom is. You know, here's where you get, you know, uh, you know, reference materials. Here's where to find people to mentor uh, you uh, and educate you. It's all about search. And then once you have the confidence that they're finding the right thing, then you start assigning them lightweight tasks. So they yes. start doing workflows. Once you trust they can find something, now you ask them to start doing things. And it's very small things. Move this package from point A to point B. Right. Many of us started in the mailroom and things of that sort, you know, uh, go ahead and bring me a cup of coffee. That's an absurd, you know, comical example. Of course, I don't think any of us uh, have really done that. Um, but um, go ahead and do this thing. And then we, we, we start getting trusted with more complex workflows. And then once we're trusted that we can find the right things and do the right things, then uh, we get authorities, um, you know, for automation. You know, we can become autonomous, right? And so because we're finding the right thing and doing the right thing over time, as we grow into our respective careers, um, you know, we get less supervision and we start, um, you know, dealing with, um, you know, uh, with um, uh, more things that we can carry on our own respective shoulders. And so AI is this kind of parlor trick in some ways. Everybody thinks that it's this godlike being and it's not. I mean, it's, you have to, you know, tend to it, you have to, uh, you know, curate it, you have to contribute to its, um, you know, to its gestation in the same way that when any of us uh, joined an organization, we got paid the same amount in salary on day one versus day three, 365. But in day 365, we were far more capable because we learned how to find the right thing and do the right thing. And we were trusted uh, to, to, you know, carry missions forward on our own after a while. And yet everybody's expecting to plug in these AIs and all of a sudden they know how to do everything on day one, which is the farthest, you know, from the truth as well. That's a good point. That's, that's a very good point. You're building a large sale company and that's not an easy endeavor. Uh, why did you choose to start this company, especially after you sold your last one? And what's, what's your philosophy on running the business? I don't think I chose to do it. I think it chose me. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think once we become mid-career professionals in some ways, think of it as a Goldilocks phase of our careers, right? You know, when we're younger, um, we don't know all that much, but we have a high degree of energy, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not formed yet. We need to be educated. We need to, to have more experiences and things of that, or especially if we want to service you know, more, you know, critical environments like enterprises and government agencies, that takes a while to figure out, right? We're, we're not the pilot in command. We're not the captain of, a, of an aircraft yet. Um, when we're far older, you know, let's say act three of our lives, um, you know, while we have may have a high degree of experience, we don't have the energy level yet. And so it's this mid-career professionals that end up becoming, you know, uh, uh, you know, business leaders and technological leaders because we have enough now uh, flight hours, you know, to yeah. use that that expression, right? To not only deal with the workflows but also deal with exceptions that are, uh, you know, an everyday occurrence, uh, you know, tending to such uh, missions, um, and then also uh, while still having a level of energy to see it through. And so for me, it take, uh, you know, if you think of all of you as, as, as you're going through a career press, where's your passions? Where's your interests? Where's your hobbies? When the, all those converge and you're happy, you know, with that thing being on your tombstone that, hey, uh, Igor reduced the distance between knowledge and people and lived a worthy life as a result of that. Once you, you find that passion and you're willing to put it on your tombstone, 
then then uh, you know your heart sings and and you're attracting people that are then purpose driven uh, around you uh, as well. And that's what I've been able to find, uh, you know, with the with this uh, uh, venture. Um, yeah, it's it's you know it's it's been a long time in coming. Uh, in some ways, I'm kind of wistful about it, uh, yes. but um, you know it's exciting. Uh, and, and we hold a high degree of responsibility for now our place in the ecosystem as well to be positive contributors of these style of technologies uh, to these places. And, and there's not a day that goes by where we don't feel like we have to earn our keep, um, you know, to support, you know, great organizations, you know, like NVIDIA, like Dell, like World Economic Forum and a mess of others that, you know, we'll be revealing over the course of the coming days, weeks uh, and, and months as well. Um, it, it is surreal in some ways, but also, you know, like I said, um, we, we've earned that in some ways through, through lots of toil and energy as, as have many of you. I mean, Jensen's not an overnight success and he is expressing that on a daily basis and correcting, you know, the, all the reporters of the world that are trying uh, to talk to him uh, now in terms of how difficult it was and all the near death experiences such organizations uh, encounter. Uh, but that's why it's important to surround yourselves with stakeholders. And I use that term very broadly. It's not just internal staff. But it's the investors ensuring, um, you know, that they uh, support the missions. And I've been extremely lucky and fortunate, um, you know, to have great backers. That's how you and I, uh, you know, first met, right, through Aperture Ventures. But we also have, you know, the Revolution's Rise of the Rest and Engage Ventures and USIT, who uh, most recently led our, our Series B round. And both Briar and Revolution that supported our Series A, Gravecroft uh, uh, Partners, Digital Alpha. There's um, uh, the Good Growth Capital folks. You know, that's where a former Apple executive is on our board as well. Liz from USIT, you know, worked in the national labs in the past as well. So to be surrounded by these uh, great people, um, you know, just heightens our responsibility for a positive outcome. Yes. Uh, for these individuals because of what they're trying to express, you know, as their worldview, like Steve Case recently, you know, getting in front of the Senate and saying that we have to democratize, you know, where AI is being born, even in second and third tier um, um, innovative markets. And you saw the Biden administration recently through the Commerce Department express some support uh, for these communities as well, because that's why it's important to, uh, you know, take care of every student and every child out there, because we have no idea where the cure for cancer will come from. Hmm. We have no idea where the invention of, of uh, truly unlimited uh, energy will come from that's clean. We have no idea where faster than light travel will come from. You know, many of us that can hear the sound of our voice, you know, come from humble backgrounds. You know, you and I were born in islands. You know, you know, me in Greece and, and you in the Caribbean, right? I mean, through, you know, rustic environments. And yet look at us being viewed as thought leaders in the highest end technology. And yet, you know, we know what it was like to carry um, water in, in a pail from a village center because we had no running water, no electricity, no television, no radio. That, uh, that connection um, uh, and humanist perspective drives our worldview for uh, a responsible AI versus all of these carnival barkers that are out there trying to worry everybody that this is, you know, going to create all sorts of poisons and, and economic distress and wars and things of that sort. I'm like, you know, you have control over that. You can press a button and make this thing do something positive or negative. This isn't something that we have to uh, be on a Disney ride and have it take us towards darkness. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting time when the, the media is involved and ads have to sell and all of these types of things. It it can really make make things a lot more difficult than I think they should be. Um, so you congrats on your hundred million dollar Series B round. Um, what was that experience like? You know, attaining that level of funding. I think, in, in my opinion, it, it's an agglomeration of all the hard work that you and team. I've put in over the years and how do you how did you go about choosing your investors to to get around like that 
Yeah, like like I said, a lot of times it's not a choice, right? It's it's uh, it's uh, earned in some ways. We um, uh, we met Thomas Toll and the USIT team via uh, Jim Breyer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jim Breyer, you know, is is most well known for being uh, the first institutional investor behind Facebook when he was at, still at Excel, and we met Jim Breyer uh, through um, uh, the Revolution team. Uh, so through Steve Case and J.D. Vance uh, in the past as well, who's now the Ohio senator. Uh, and then we met Revolution through other uh, other parties, right, like Good Growth Capital uh, and, and the like as well. And so it's been a whole ecosystem that's been gestating around us as well. But, you know, I also have to, you know, give credit to the fact that there's other senior leaders in the organization from you know, our engineering and research VPs and solutions VPs, but also, uh, you know, David Nahumu, who's our chief scientist, uh, that was able to essentially show a, a, a bleeding edge um, uh, incarnation of these style of technologies that uh, people were willing to under underwrite. Uh, and then uh, also, you don't get a Series B if you're not balancing the equation between technology and go to markets. And, and Chris Small joining us uh, in the last you know couple of years was a seminal moment for the company because he was one of the original Oracle executives that Benioff brought in uh, to help him run Salesforce from year two through IPO. So that level of discipline to ensure that that we are inventing um, uh, and innovative uh, and innovating in a in a way that is tip of the spear, but then it's connecting to, to uh, a business outcomes uh, that are measurable and important to these organizations. Uh, like I've heard, um, you know, some uh, interesting uh, comments um, by Mark Cuban here recently, that the goal of sales is not to influence people to buy um, your products or services. The goal of sales is to help people. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's it. And so at times, you know, people are actually willing to give us far more, um, uh, you know, a bigger price tag. They're willing to give us, uh, you know, to pay for a platform. And we take less than they're willing to give us because that's uh, uh, because we're willing to earn our keep. We're willing to show them that this has real value because we trust on the other side of being able to prove that, that they're willing to continue taking care of our R&D team and the rest of our team, uh, you know, to their benefit as well. So uh, I'm perhaps a little bit counterintuitive uh, where I don't seek to maximize you know, economic gains. I seek to max- maximize product quality and fit to the important missions our customers and partners have and trust that they will take care of us because they will want us to be the finest representation of AI enhanced knowledge management in 2023, 2024. 2025 and as far into the future that uh as they'll have us beautiful what are some things that uh, people should consider when they go to attempt to raise a hundred million dollar round i think not many people can say that they've done a hundred million dollar round and with with such strong backers as well well i mean it, it, part of the issue is if they're seeking that they're already not going to get it mm. Right. I mean, it's, okay. it's that 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 wasn't the thing driving me. Like I said before, you know, if you're driving, you know, a product set to those, you know, positive outcomes that I just expressed, then the investment community shows up and says, we believe in that being, um, you know, something that's valuable to our communities and certainly valuable to these industries that we feel that will eventually adopt these style of technologies and true growth investors. When you think about series B and onwards only show up when they start having conviction that this is going to be a mandatory part of these ecosystems uh, over time. And they're willing to underwrite that early growth. And then eventually you'll have series C and onwards. Um, Mm -hmm. I also don't know what, you know, the eventual outcome for this organization is going to be, whether it's an IPO or M&A, because as people ask me, Hey, what's your, you know, exit, um, you know, strategy, there isn't one, right. It's building for growth. It's becoming, uh, it's defining a new category and showing the market's leading representation of a product for that category uh, as, as well. Um, that's that's what our goal in life is. Anything else is an exit fantasy. You know, it just mm-hmm. doesn't exist. So, so um, you know, like that toddler in that YouTube video, you know, who says, worry about yourself, just do your work. 
do your work and and uh, you know continue building rapport and relationships with the investment community. And at the right time and place, you know you'll earn. Remember that word. I've used it several times. You'll earn um, that that um, unlocking further resources in order to uh, allow you to grow to the next milestone as well. Anybody that's seeking this, you know, it, and uh, will will probably get it in an environment like this where people are, are throwing, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, financial resources like popcorn at a, at a circus. Um, but then ultimately, you know, they'll, they'll come, you know, buy this easy money and it's, uh, the hilarity, uh, uh like the hilarity of winning the lottery, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or being a trust fund cake kid. Right. So, um, if you and I would be given a million dollars, Right. In a big publisher's clearinghouse uh, check, somebody will check in on us the following year and we'll probably have two to 10 million that we've turned it into because we've created wealth uh, the difficult way the you know, by working hard uh, towards it as well. And we would be responsible stewards of that capital. Folks that get this capital easy, like you've heard absurd seed rounds that are 100 million, absurd series A's that could go, be up to a billion dollars and things of that sort. It's it's like it's like those um, uh, individuals that I just uh, mentioned. They'll evaporate it. You know, they'll be throwing spaghetti on the wall. They'll be going in all these different directions that are unfocused. They are they aren't uh, going to be disciplined about it as well. And and so the other side of it, they'll have little to show for it. Um, but I don't worry too much about about what people could express as 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 the word competition um, because. You know, uh, I'm going to sound like a cliche. Look in the mirror if you want to see the the world's most terrifying competitor. Um, because what's inside of me is the fact that I looked, uh, I look and remember uh, the sacrifices that my parents, grandparents, and great grandparents made to even give me this opportunity to to allow me the freedom uh, to create these style of things. That should hopefully benefit the rest of you that are that are hearing me, uh, and and that's the that's my yardstick. I'm not really worried about other things. I'm worried about about those sacrifices of mentors and educators and things of that sort in terms of contributing, uh, you know, their time and energy in, into me as well. And what do I want out of it? Do I want to sell more ads? Do I want to put more videos in, in, in uh, teenagers' faces? And I know I want, I want to make sure that people are getting accurate information you know, as fast as possible to support hospital environments, to support you know, municipalities, right? uh, you know, to support you know, uh, you know, a healthy way of life. That's, that's what char- supercharges me, and it attracts you know, some of the best practitioners I've ever encountered. Um, to this organization and it and attracts, you know, you know, you know, some of the base, best benefactors I've ever encountered as well. I think you're unique in a sense of having an extremely strong engineering culture in addition to now an extremely strong enterprise grade sales culture. Um, what What's your take on attracting and retaining talent? Because that's oftentimes the hardest thing to do to build a very strong enterprise that can serve their customers um, what's been your lessons there yeah and i think part of it is just the being authentic you know mm-hmm. to, being honest with people in terms of what you're about i'm not coin operated i literally i'm, I'm not coin up but I've, I've shown up in in what you would consider a customer engagement and telling them that you cannot buy what i'm about to show you hmm. you know it's completely it's completely backwards i care more about them having positive outcomes then I care about me having a positive outcome. That if Brian wouldn't work for them, I would tell him, look, you have to do something because you're an important you know, contributor to safeguarding our way of life. And I want you to find it anywhere you can get it, even if it's not you know, off, off, uh, off our works. And that builds a, sen- a sense of rapport and trust with those environments where they start getting curious about what, they, about what we can do. And maybe it's a year later. Maybe it's five years later. Maybe it's 10 years later. But I care more about maintaining, um, you know, that relationship with those individuals and those organizations than I care about, you know, any sort of economic motive. Now, don't get me wrong. 
that does end up, you know, you know, attracting more folks that want to work with us in every way, shape and form in, in different capacities. But it also essentially sets a stage in terms of my expectations for the for the team as well. It's like mm-hmm. do everything possible in order for everybody to have um, a great experience on our on our platform, because everybody has to know something to do something. And 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 if we're working with responsible organizations, we want them to be more efficient. We want them to project their worldview out there. So let's leave every stone unturned. I mean, there's been things that that. Um, uh, that NVIDIA asked us to do literally in terms of technological advancements that when I interviewed, you know, high end, you know, AI practitioners uh, coming to us from Google, I asked them as part of their interview process, how long would it take you to create that piece of technology? Uh, They didn't know that it was for NVIDIA at the time. And they told me three months, Mm -hmm. they told me three months. Our team had it done over a weekend. Wow. They broke their backs, that, and it was a very high-end piece of technology and component. This was not something that you can just go into Hugging Face and download, or or, or go into a Stack Overflow and, and get some sample code. I mean, we broke our backs to, to deliver it as fast as possible because the organization needed it, and it was it was for a good reason. Um, but that's because we care. So ultimately. You know, I care about people that care about themselves, they, that care about the communities, that care about the mission and things of that sort. And like, you know, tends to attract like as well. Mark, I spend a lot more time talking about what? About uh, anthropology, about history, about human factors, user experiences, behavioral science than I do, you know, talking about technology. Because if you and I, you know, on this show would have talked about technology, like I said before, it would be as perishable as getting fruits and vegetables from Trader Joe's. Technology is going to change. The the, the stuff that people are, are buying from uh, NVIDIA this year for billions of dollars that's leading to, you know, great marks, you know, in Wall Street and things of that sort, you know, are already obsolete based on the great stuff that's coming next year and the year after mm-hmm. and the year after that as well. So all you can do is present to us the finest representation of this era's uh, style of technology today. But you also, you know, you know, have the community's trust in terms of continuing, um, you know, to create, you know, future platforms that will benefit and, and hopefully improve conditions, you know, for the world at large uh, as well. Right. That's a worthy mission. Same thing with us. You know, if you want me to talk about, you know, hey, tell me about this LLM. Tell me about on a GPT. Tell me about Langchain. Tell me about these transformers. Tell me about conformers. Tell me about this or that, blah, blah, blah. It's like, who cares? There's going to be another paper tomorrow that's going to make that obsolete as well. But what is not perishable is, is um, you know, you know, a human drive to improve uh, things for as many people as possible. So that we can open up the aperture to economic mobility, so that we can solve you know some of these existential crises, whether we're talking about war, whether we're talking about clean water, where we're talking about you know reducing poverty, increase you know reducing hunger, and things of that sort. That's why you know I, I tell folks that you should have no complaints. There's nothing hard about what we do. I know people like to you know high five each other and and bite their fingernails and talk about how stressful it is to be in the tech industry and things of that sort. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're sitting in front of a MacBook with a cappuccino compared to what all these other folks are, 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 are toiling away every day compared to what your family, uh, uh members in the past and predecessors experience, um, and, and sacrifice for you. This is a cakewalk. So take, take a level of responsibility. Right. You know, get, you know, get a little bit more hardened about it and and have that sense of purpose and don't do what I do. Right. Go do something different. Go do something new. Right. Because all of us, you know, are, are a different vegetable into the stone soup of, of innovation. Right. Nobody should be competing with anybody. If you see what I do, go do something different and new and novel that can clip into that. There's plenty of things before me after me, above me, and below me that I can't do. I don't know how to build aircraft. I don't know how to build cars. I don't know how to grow food. There's certain, uh, you know, numerous uh, elements of technology that I don't know how to do. But for this one thing, I can tell you, 
I've been working on it for decades. Mm -hmm. you know, there's no reason for anybody to do anything in this realm because it's not just something that we just woke up, you know, last year and said, oh, that's kind of interesting. Maybe we should start figuring it out. There's a lot of flight hours here associated with this style of technology. But if everybody can contribute unique voices uh, and, and capabilities into that, then it just benefits everybody. You know, and by the way, if somebody else was doing this in a worthy way, when this company was started, I wouldn't have started it. I'm not a Xerox machine. I would have not started this company if I would have seen this from Amazon, if I would have seen this from Microsoft, if I would have seen this from Google, and it just wasn't there in 2017. Right. So that's, that's why we got started. Amazing. You're a, you're a good representation of a a successful island boy, right? We're both island boys here. And, um, you know, my, you're my first guest from Greece. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I, I do my best to try to represent people from their original home regions, just because oftentimes a lot of people in different parts of the world will never have the opportunities that we have here in the States. Right. We're at the bleeding edge of AI and we, we get to do, uh, very cool things. So as we, as we wrap up, what's been your career optimization function? you know, that has led you to this point? Is it curious, intellectual curiosity? Was it wealth? What, how did that change over time? Yeah. So a great question, uh, Mark, and a complicated one, right? Because we're entangled with, with so many different things. I can't here, here, here's a funny one. I would have never predicted this would have happened. And yet, you know, I remember a family member giving me a briefcase when I was a teenager that had a little card in there that called me Mr. CEO. Mm -hmm. So they already saw uh, me projecting, uh, you know, a more serious, um, you know, perspective on, on wanting to do something. But I did it, you know, I, I was an intern and I was an entry level, you know, research engineer in IBM Microelectronics, you know, when I first started. Um, you know, as Gary Shandling, the famed comedian said, there's no shortcut, uh, you know, to, to comedy, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's hard one, you know, to, to get into, um, you know, what we're eventually going to earn as, as what our roles would be in the future as well. And it's not, you know, title driven. It's more impact uh, driven. One of the things, Mark, that I can express to everybody that's, that's hearing this is there's a clue. There's actually a, um, an interesting little shortcut for what you should be in terms of your identity. And you know what it is? Two o'clock in the morning. At two o'clock in the morning, what are you doing? Ooh. Right? Mm -hmm. The thing that's keeping you up, even though you have to catch an early flight, you have to you know, go to work, you, know, you have to go to the gym, you have to you know, go to school and things of that sort. But at two o'clock in the morning, what are you doing? Are you painting? Mm -hmm. Are you writing a book, right? Are you bartending? Are you dancing? You know, are you, you know, um, you know, um, writing code, right? What are you doing at two o'clock in the morning? What are you reading at that time? You know, are you reading things associated with media and entertainment? Are you playing sports, you know, under, under floodlights, you know, even though you should be going to sleep, whatever that thing is that you're doing, are you cooking? right? And trying different, uh, you know, combinations of things as well. Are you driving around and taking homeless people into shelters? Whatever that thing is that you're doing at two o'clock in the morning, you should find a way to, to, to make it your career, you know, because you must derive satisfaction and joy and passion from that as well. Now, of course, our respective family members see what we're doing at two o'clock in the morning and they're chuckling and they think it's boring and they're, and they're, you know, whining and complaining. And it's like, come on, you know, uh, how can it be that you care about that so much? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I remember being in the back of cocktail parties, you know, or birthday parties with my family members, and I would be talking into this little razor flip phone, and it would be talking to me for years, for decades, and they would be chuckling to themselves that I must be schizophrenic or things like that, because they just see me talking to myself the whole time. And yet I'm chiseling away, right? Every day, even before coming onto this uh, show with you, right? I'm writing little product ideas for the, for the team as all these different things, you know, pop in my head as, as light bulbs. This platform that we're, we're creating uh, in Prime, I dreamt it up. I literally dreamt it up and woke up and then sketched it out on my iPad and said, that's peculiar and started talking to buddies of mine that were at Amazon 
at Cisco, uh, at IBM and things like that and said, hey, this is peculiar. What do you think? And it was a new way of doing things that even the things that all of you think are new over the course of the last year were, were discovered and thought of over a uh, half decade ago. And that's why we started working towards this. Connecting uh, to our shared island ex experience, the first time ever that I think I had a thought about, about artificial intelligence and machine translation was when I was a small boy on that island where we had um, uh, this rustic uh, experience, of course. And I once intersected and encountered a dolphin that was hurt by a propeller. Hmm. And that's the first time I remember, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, something, uh, you know, popping in my head, why can't I talk to you? And that's it. So if you think about these influences in terms of what people should be and what identity they should have and what, you know, products should they project into, into the world at times, you know, you just ask what's the critical path and what's the thing that, that, uh, that formed us. You, you can find a myriad of these, uh, of these things in, in, you know, days past, weeks past, months past, quarters past, years past, decades past as well. And, and it almost in some ways becomes a form of predestination in the same way that you and I as children heard mythology. And the only thing that mythology was about, it wasn't just, hey, look at what all these gods are doing in Mount Olympus and things like that. It's look at what the humans are doing as they intersect, you know, these powers that are far beyond them as well. And the fact that we're still able to survive and thrive. So what is technology if not um, a, a representation of these godlike superpowers? But as humans, and, and, uh, and especially as mortal humans, we're trying to marshal these things towards positive ends. That is a life worth living. Beautiful. I, I really resonate with you at 2 o'clock in the morning. I've never heard actually one. And he said, I ask a lot of people for advice. I've interviewed, I think, over 50-something people so far. And that was beautifully put. Um, Igor, I, I really appreciate the time. I know I know you're on a crunch. Um, any any sort of final words for, for folks listening? I don't think I can top that. But Mark, I appreciate uh, the fact that you're trying to get these diverse voices um, uh, out here as well. And, and like I said, each of us uh, holds a piece to the puzzle as well. And, um, and as long as each one of you finds your passions and, and we can find each other and, and work together towards positive ends, the future is bright. It doesn't have to be this darkness that a lot of these AI carnival barkers, uh, you know, talk about as well, um, because it's within the realm of possibility for us to nurture and guide it towards that. Fantastic. For all, for all the other island folks out there, represent. Mm -hmm.